This video is supported by Simple Contacts. Today is the last day of 2018. Tonight we're all going to stay up late, toast the year that was, and welcome in the new year. Auld Lang Syne and all that. It's a chance to let go of the past and, you know, embrace a new future of opportunities, new possibilities. We set goals, we set resolutions, all with the purpose of making ourselves better people. New Year's Day is a fresh start, a clean slate. It's like a do-over we get every year. Of course, I mean, there's nothing really special about New Year's Day. All we're really celebrating is that the Earth has returned to this arbitrary point in its orbit that it was the last time we stayed up late to watch a ball drop. It's only special because we decided it was special when we put it at the top of our calendar. A calendar that's friggin' weird when you look at it. You know, why 12 months? And why do some months have 30 days and some have 31? And What's up with February? September, October, November, December clearly correlate with the numbers 7, 8, 9, and 10, and yet they are on our calendars as the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th months. Defa. Today more than ever, we are ruled by calendars. We run our lives by our calendars. They're in our computers, in our phones, even in our cars. But how did we come up with this bizarre system of time measurement? And is there a better way? The first thing to understand about calendars is that they're not really a measurement of time, they're a measurement of cycles. And this is what makes our calendars so weird. We're actually measuring three different cycles. The Earth rotating on its axis, the Earth revolving around the Sun, and the Moon revolving around Earth. And they do not choose to line up nicely for us. The most immediate of these, and the one that affects our life the most, is the day and night cycles. Our circadian rhythms are literally encoded into our DNA. So we got pretty accurate with this, measuring the day to 24 hours with respect to the sun. 24 hours divides into four quarters of six hours each, which roughly correlate to the position of the sun, depending on where you are in the world latitude-wise and in the seasons and whatnot. So the sun rises, six hours later it's overhead at noon, six hours later it's setting, six hours later it's midnight, and the cycle repeats. Now this is what's called a solar day because again it is in relation to the sun. But there is also a stellar day which is a little bit shorter at 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. And this is in relation to the stars. Because the earth isn't just spinning, it's also moving in its orbit. So by the time the earth is rotated to face the sun again, it's actually moved from where it was before. Meaning it has to rotate just a little bit further to line up with the sun for 3 minutes and 56 seconds exactly. So the sun stays in our crosshairs, but the stars behind it have moved just a little bit from our perspective. And over the weeks and months, this adds up, causing the stars to kind of move across the sky. And as we move around the sun, we see different constellations in the sky because we're looking in different directions relative to the sun. So tonight, while you're celebrating, you might go outside and see Orion in the sky. But go outside in June, you might see Scorpio. This is obviously where our zodiac signs came from. Back in the day, it correlated with what constellation was behind the sun at that time. And the time it takes for the Earth to revolve around the sun is exactly 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds. Because it can't just make things easy, can it? But hey, 5 hours and 48 minutes, that's pretty close to 6 hours. Which, as I said earlier, 4 quarters of 6 hours make up a 24 hour day. So, at the end of every year, we just kind of drop those 6 hours, and then every 4 years, we add an extra day to make up for it. Calendar nerds call these intercalary days, of course, we call these leap days. Mostly in line, but there's still that extra 11 minutes and 14 seconds each year, but we make up for that by dropping the leap year every 100 years except for the ones that are divisible by 400. Why? Because math, that's why. This is of course the Gregorian calendar that we use in the United States and in most of the Western world. The Gregorian calendar was named after Pope Gregory the 13th, which instituted this calendar in 1582. It was designed so that Easter would fall right after the spring equinox, and in order to make this happen they actually had to drop 10 days from the Catholic calendar and we complain about having to set our clocks forward one hour. Of course, not everyone is Catholic, so it took a while for this kind of filter throughout the rest of the world. Russia, for example, was kind of run by the Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, they actually didn't get on board the Gregorian train until the revolution in 1917. In fact, the Russian Olympic team missed the London Games in 1908 because of this whole, we're on a totally different calendar thing. Hey, we're Russia! I've been training my whole life for this! Let's do this! Let's kick some ass! Yeah, we're all headed home. What? calendar. Son of a! As for what year we celebrate, that was actually set in the year 525 by the monk Dionysius Exegus, who determined that Jesus was born in the Roman year 753, and he started counting from there. Meaning there were people living in the Roman year 1278, who woke up one morning being told that it was actually the year 525. That would be like if tomorrow you were told that it's actually the year 1266. And here come the Viking hordes. 
Of course, the years before year zero were designated BC for before Christ, and the years after that were AD, which many people think stands for after death. It actually stands for Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. This is, of course, very Christian. So in the interest of inclusion, we started calling it BCE, so before the Common Era, and then we call the era we're in right now the Common Era, CE. This era, so common. So Dionysius Exegus actually changed the calendar about a thousand years before the Gregorian calendar went into effect, which means that he was working off of the precursor to the Gregorian calendar, the Julian calendar. The Julian calendar was named after Julius Caesar, who implemented this calendar in the year 45 BCE, which was the year 709 in Roman years. Uh, Roman years were based off of what year the city of Rome was founded. The Julian calendar was pretty similar to what wound up being the Gregorian calendar. They still had leap days every four years, but it still got out of whack over the centuries. Now the big difference over the previous Roman calendar was that the Julian calendar was a solar calendar, and the previous Roman calendar was a lunar calendar. And this brings us to months. Now I haven't really talked about months so far, but this lines up with the third cycle that I talked about earlier, that of the moon revolving around the Earth which takes exactly 27.32 days. Early civilizations used cycles of the moon to determine all kinds of things, especially when it came to like planting and harvesting crops. So the earliest calendars were mostly lunar calendars. Later calendars like the Julian calendar actually incorporated both months and years. These are called lunisolar calendars. Early Roman calendars were called the calendar of Romulus. They were actually 10 months long, reflecting 10 lunar cycles, and incorporated a 50-day unorganized winter at the end of it. They literally had 50 days of I don't know, it's cold. The first four months of the calendar were named after Roman and Greek gods, and then after that they just kind of started counting the months, I guess because they ran out of gods. So the first month of the year was March, or what they called it Mensis Martius, named after Mars, the Roman god of war. Then April, or Mensis Apru, named for Aphrodite. May was Mensis Maius, for the goddess Maya, and June, or Mensis Eunice, for the goddess Juno. After that they started numbering them, Quintilis, Sextilis, September, October, November, and December and then the weird 50-day whatever period. Later updates corrected for this weird 50-day whatever period by adding January and February to the beginning of the calendar. This explains why February is so short, and it also explains why the last four months of the year clearly don't line up with the numbers that they were named after. Quintilis was eventually renamed July in honor of Julius Caesar, and Sextilis was renamed August for Emperor Augustus. And that is how we got this weird convoluted system of time management that runs our lives today. By the way, if you ever want to know whether the month that you're in has 30 or 31 days in it, there is a trick that I know about, and it involves your knuckles. I don't know who came up with this, and I don't know how common knowledge this is. You may all already know about this, but uh, you can use your knuckles to figure out whether a month has 30 or 31 days. Basically, the hills and valleys of your knuckles correspond to long and short months. So January has 31 days. February has 28. It's a short month. March 31, April, May, June, July. July and August both have 31 days, so you come back over here, 31 for August, September, October, November, December. I heard about this when I was a kid, and to this very day, you'll see me like doing this from trying to figure out what, how many days are in a month. So, all of this begs the question, is this the best we can do? There have been many attempts to reform the calendar over the years, usually with the purpose of making it a little bit smoother and universal and, you know, logical. The French Revolutionary Calendar was created in France during the French Revolution, which you probably could have guessed. The French Revolution was all about starting from scratch and completely throwing out the old ways of doing things. This is actually when the metric system took hold, and the French Revolutionary Calendar was sort of an attempt at creating metric time. It divided the day into 10 hours, made up of 100 decimal minutes, which were made up of 100 decimal seconds. They kept the 12 months in the calendar, but divided the months into three weeks of 10 days each and every fourth year they added a leap day, which they called a sextile. And we're just getting started with the weirdness. They chose to start the year in autumn, so the first day of their calendar would correspond with September 22nd on the Gregorian calendar. And the months were completely renamed to remove any imperial or religious references. And every day of the year was given a name that corresponded to nature or the elements. For example, December 31st would be granite in the month of Nivos. The years were counted from the beginning of the French Republic in 1792, again to take away any religious influences, and weirdly, they chose to count the years in Roman numerals, which seems like it would be about as anti-metric as you can get. Which got them all the way up to the year X. Because after 10 years and many severed heads later, they decided to go Gregorian again. Can't imagine why. 
In the 1930s, another movement to reform the calendar got started. This one was called the World Calendar, and it came really close to being accepted. It was pushed by Elizabeth Achilles, who headed up the World Calendar Association, who pushed this to the League of Nations and later the UN. It looks a lot like what we've got now, but the main goal was to make it so that the dates would always fall on the same day of the week. So for example, February 1st would always be a Wednesday. Basically, it divided the year into four equal quarters of exactly 91 days. Each quarter had a 31-30-30 cadence, so January would have 31 days, February 30, March 30, and then start over again in April with 31. The big difference was at the end of every year following December 30th, they added what they called World's Day. It didn't have a number designation, just the W, and it was kind of just an off-the-calendar day that would be treated like a holiday. So December 30th would be a Saturday, and then you would have World's Day, and then January 1st would start on a Sunday. Leap years would be handled the same way, adding a leap year day after June 30th, which was a Saturday, and before July 1st, which was a Sunday. The benefit to this was that every single year would line up exactly the same way, so you wouldn't have to like buy a new calendar every year, just change the year number at the top. The calendar did run into objections by religious communities that worship on a seven day cycle because the whole world day thing would interrupt their seven days, you know, honor the seventh day and keep it holy kind of thing. This actually gained a surprising amount of acceptance at the UN, but ultimately failed to be accepted. Although the World Calendar Association is still around. One last calendar that's worth mentioning is the Hanke Henry calendar, which was actually just introduced in 2011. This one works a lot like the World Calendar in the sense that it's a permanent calendar, it's the same every year, and it operates on 91 day quarters. But this one uses a 30-30-31 cadence, and instead of adding world days or leap days to make everything line up, they actually added an entire intercalary week at the end of the calendar every five or six years that they called Extra Week. That's the week we all act over the top flamboyant, I guess. So extra. Now this gets around the religious issue that I mentioned earlier, but it also conforms to the date and time standard ISO 8601 protocol that also wouldn't have worked with the world calendar. Links to information about all these down in the description below. Finally, let's look way into the future. What happens when we go to Mars and we start colonizing other worlds in our solar system? How do we keep time and synchronize with each other without basing it on the cycles of a planet that you don't live on anymore? Like, what would a star date system from Star Trek look like? It might look something like Unix time. Unix, of course, references the Unix computer operating system, and the programmers that set that up created its own time that started in January 1st, 1970. And it literally just keeps track of seconds, every day being 86,400 seconds. No weeks, months, or years, no seasons, no cycles, nothing that connects it to the rhythm of the Earth. Just a continuous time that we can all keep synchronized. Unless we start traveling at relativistic speeds, but that's a whole other video. Now I know I left a lot of calendars out of this discussion. This is very Gregorian centric, but there's a lot of ancient calendars like the Mayan calendar that's really interesting and worth talking about, but also modern day calendars that are still in use. The Hebrew calendar, the Islamic calendar, the Chinese calendar, I could go on and on. Each of these really interesting in their own ways and heavily influenced by the culture that created it. The cycles of life and the calendars that document them have a really strong pull on our psyche. I think that's kind of why I don't think Unix time would really work, because there's nothing really to emotionally connect us to that. You know, when I say March, that means something to you. You might think about green clovers growing out on the lawn, or, you know, it's starting to get windy. When I say September, you might start thinking about school getting started, or the summer heat starting to break. Now, there's a reason why we use months named after gods that haven't been worshipped for thousands of years. These are ancient constructs that give our life structure and meaning. So in that sense, New Year's Day isn't just some arbitrary day, it's a celebration of a passage of another cycle of life. One we get precious few of, and one that binds us all together. So with that, I wish you all a happy and healthy 2019. May your new year be so prosperous and wonderful that you just can't even see straight. And if you can't see straight, today's sponsor is Simple Contacts. Hey, have you ever noticed the logo for my channel has me wearing glasses, but I'm not wearing glasses in most of my videos? It's because I wear contacts. I've had terrible eyesight my whole life, and I started wearing contacts my sophomore year in high school. This was before Bill Clinton was president. God, I'm old. I've used just about every online contact retailer there is, but seriously, Simple Contacts is the easiest thing I've ever seen. You know, the biggest headache about ordering contacts online is you gotta get a prescription from a doctor, and of course they wanna sell it to you themselves at a higher price, so you gotta do the whole like, no, no, I just wanted the prescription, I'm gonna uh, frame it and put it on my wall or something. With Simple Contacts, you take your eye exam right on your computer or your smartphone. It's reviewed by an actual eye doctor, and then you just pick out what contacts you want, and it's on your front porch in a matter of days. 
Now I do need to say this online test only makes sure that your prescription is accurate. You still need to go in and see an eye doctor on a regular basis to make sure you don't have like worms growing in your eyes or something. They have dozens of brands of contacts, so whatever type you like putting in your eyes, they've got it. And you also have the option to subscribe. They'll automatically renew and just send you new contacts every six months. Viewers of this channel, that would be you, can get $20 off of your contacts order if you go to simplecontacts.com slash answerswithjoe. Take it from a guy who's been wearing contacts for longer than many of you have even been alive. This is awesome service. So it's simplecontacts.com slash answerswithjoe. Links in the description. Thanks so much to Simple Contacts for supporting this video and a big shout out as always to the answer files on Patreon that are help keeping the lights on around here, forming a great community and I'm getting to know these people and I like them quite a bit. There's some new people that have added uh, to the tribe here. I'm going to just destroy their names real quick. We've got Christian Bergman, Ryan Garnum, Philip Estrom, uh, Jeremy Sartori, Jack Shedd, Matt Sardone, Doug Mai, Mark Benthin, Marvin Ullman, Christian Warren, uh, Shane Miller, Aaron Petiti, Joel Davis, Squigglenut, Matt D, Mikhail Ramakaran, I think, uh, Marcus Bones, Ski Bike Hike, Thomas Erskine, uh, Dennis B, Russ Henderson, Blair LaDuke, and Shane Guthrie and Dario. Uh, thank you guys so much. There's actually a lot more names that I have not gotten to yet. I've got a big backlog and I apologize to those of you who are waiting. I will get your names out eventually. But if you would like to join these guys and get access to early videos and behind the scenes stuff and just get to hear from me on a regular basis, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that or any of my other videos. And if you do like them, uh, maybe subscribe because I do come back with videos just like this every Monday and Thursday. T-shirts as always are available at the store, answerswithdoe.com slash shirts. Lots of really cool nerdy designs by a really cool guy. Benefits the channel, benefits him, and it benefits you because you look cool. So uh, go check it out. Thanks again for watching. You guys have an eye-opening 2019. I hope you have the most wonderful new year and prosperous 2019 you can possibly have. Love you guys. Take care.